Attention, denizens of the Imperial Palace and beyond. This Voxcast publique is designated... Uh... Omega, Prioris. Continue your operations, but listen at least partly to this very... inappropriate announcement. Thought for the day. You have to be 18 standard or older to listen to this. Anything else is unsuitable and heresy. <laughs> this was not the kind of break I, uh... Dumpy Grimbo. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I am Manclesiarch Decius the 23rd. I have been brought onto this Vox cast to... Well, this record goes by the name Inquisitor, written by illustrious scribe Ian Watson, author of the screen story for Steve Spielman's AI. It is the oldest non-anthology record found in the library. Its age surpasses even that of records covering the horror's heresy. It indeed seems to be even older than the library itself. This tome was found in several different publications, with its alternative title being... Draco, by Ian Watson, author of the screen story for Steve Spellman's AI. It is the first part of the Inquisition War trilogy by Ian Watson, author of the screen for Stephen's abominable intelligence. It's also been found by me under the names of the Philoflop Philoxa Philosopher's Stone and the Sausager's Stone by Ian Watson, author of the Harry Spielberg series. It is a book by Ian Watson. Author of the screen story for Steph Spellborg's A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A I have never read this book. I do not know why, but now I have, and my life has forever changed. This book has awakened things in me. Terrible things. I yet see them through my empty eye. This book was a mistake. Uh, Ripley Minotaur apps. I am sorry, boy. Oh, you see things that aren't there through an eye you no longer have to? This book is a cold, wet towel wrapped around the midriff of my mind. It drenches us with its lurid texts, the text that is the water dribbling from the frigid towel that is this book, soaking us until one can do not to become united with one's uncomfort. Y yeah, yes, that, that is literally how the book is written throughout. It is like... Sour magic. Yes! Magic! Living chocolate amphibians? A ridiculous prospect. To be wholly transparent, however, I personally kind of... enjoyed as perhaps a bit strong, but... liked this book? It was wacky, uproarious, and... Quite the ride. But you are wrong, King of Nipples! This book proves beyond doubt why the normals have to be eradicated, you see! What did you just fucking call me? Throughout the reading of this, we discovered that this writer has, incidentally, also penned a record filed under the name of... Orgas Machine. What? We have not had the distinct pleasure of reading that one. But based on our findings, reading Inquisitor, Ian Watson also writing a book called... Orgas Machine. <clears throat> Makes a lot of sense. My Emperor! Please join me in my crusade to kink shame Ian Watson back to the Eye of Terror. Tell us of your opinion. 
numerous times. This record tries to insinuate that I am little more than an raving skeleton upon a golden toilet. Therefore I hit it, and it needs to go. You've insinuated such things about yourself on numerous occasions, father. Nobody riff on me, but me. He's, He's right, right, you know. know. That's mighty petulant, father. Is there anything of value to be gleaned from this foul text, my lord? I believe there to be some erudite knowledge intermingled with the layers of rancid fluff that thickens this book. It would, however, be hard for anyone to coerce this knowledge on a single read. It is tile over substance given form. In what manner should we go about covering the contents of this record? There is only one way. We must cover each chapter. One. By. One. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Why? Because. Quote. Stangley Kubrick, legendary Hollywood directographist, in conversation with Ian Watson, author of the screen story for Steve Spielman's up-and-coming project, A. So, Strangely, I sent you a pre-publication copy of my new book Inquisitor that I have written. Please tell me what you think of it. Oh, nausea. Maybe this is my next movie. Oh, nausea. Maybe this is my next movie. Maybe this is my next movie. Maybe this is my next movie. Next movie. Next movie. <sighs> Let us begin. Inquisitor. Pre-prologue. This book begins with a pre-prologue as so many books of legend do. It first needs pointing out that there are many minor differences between the record named Inquisitor and the one named Draco. Draco is... N Baby. Draco is the name of the Inquisitor we follow throughout this epic, and I figure the name change was a result of the Inquisition not wanting Jacques Draco and his base love quest associated with the Inquisition as a brand. It appears as though Draco is a newer version of the same book. Oh, huh, yes. But with some changes to certain elements and descriptors, possibly in an effort to cover up unwanted information. As is the Inquisition's want. Morbidly accurate, Ecclesiarch. Man, Ecclesiarch, please. <laughs> Man, Ecclesiarch? Well, the pre prologue of Draco does make this clear with a note that reads, and my condolences in beforehand, for it is quite long. My Lord High Inquisitor, I have now examined this particular archive as you requested of me. I can state that the text does truly date from a time around 1200 years before the present day. However, in the absence of a true physical copy of the work, dating a record that exists only as a data file upon our cogitator with any real precision is beyond the abilities of even my most skilled tech priests. As to its content, there is little to tell. I have been unable to acquire any evidence of the existence of an Inquisitor of our order by the name of Jock Draco. Indeed, my researches have led me to believe that none of the orders have any record of such a personage. However, I have not been permitted access to their most hidden archives, and I cannot therefore offer a definitive answer as to his non-existence. Of his outlandish companions, I have more mixed feelings. The work itself states that the Calidus Temple acknowledges the presence upon its role of infamy as such named assassin. Yet in all my years, I have never heard of such a request for information producing such an unequivocal result. The secretive leaders of the assassin shrines openly would even acknowledge any such query from those outside their order is, frankly, unbelievable. The Navigator, well, well we know of all the scorn with which our brothers in the Navi's nobility regard outside inquiries. As to the Abhuman, the thread is cut. The accursed hive fleet of the Tyranid put paid to that line too long ago. 
I cannot believe, however, that even a renegade inquisitor, if that is what this Draco really was, would tolerate the presence of such a disgusting mutation. Lord, I understand full well that my role is to examine the facts as they are presented, to report upon the technical aspects of this archive alone, but I must confess to you now, I am sorely troubled. I have been serving you in my capacity as Master Librarian for two centuries now, but never have you asked me to report upon such a tangled morass of bare half-truths and inferences. If even a fragment of what this memoir purports to reveal is truthful, it implies a conspiracy of the most mind-warping complexity. Yet where is the evidence? Without it, this work can be nothing but a blasphemous heresy, a traitorous farago of the most evil kind. This work would be better destroyed than be recorded in any form, lest it one day be revealed to cause who knows what damage to the minds of scholars less skeptical than ourselves. I implore you, Lord, let me erase this heresy. May the Golden Throne watch over you. Ah. Maybe this is my next movie. Yeah. This inquisitorial droning was no doubt added after the record was, somehow, discovered by the rest of the Inquisition. The conclusion of their review of this book is eerily similar to mine. I have to say though, Uncle Vernon was a dutiful man. His loyalty to the Imperium was commendable. His son's death to the parish abumen was tragic. Don't remember that, but looking at the epilogue of the pre-prologue, I liked when they had to specify that the squats are all dead simply because a squat appeared in the record as one of Inquisitor Draco's followers. Oh, if you don't happen to know, dear listeners, the squats were a strain of very short and, well, squat, abhumans that lived here in the galaxy at some point. Don't quite recall when. <laughs> they were basically bikerd motors from space. Oh right, they died to Tyranid invasion! Eaten! So many corpses! Yeah, here are I but the, Then the Tyranids evolved the ability to be short, eh? I have to say, oh. I am surprised the mutant loathing Inquisition didn't just straight up censor the Squat's identity and replace it with, uh, say, that of a tech priest or something. I, I, I feel like... I've seen that done somewhere else, but not in any of these publications. Regardless, more squad formation will be unearthed in the reading. Let us go! Inquisitor. Prologue. The prologue begins with another warning. Befitting of this book. Unlike the former. This warning is also plastered onto the original version. It explains that this record is the Liber Secretorum, or the Book of Secrets, of Jock Draco, the renegade inquisitor, the individual whom we follow through this record. So what would a Liber Secretorum be? <laughs> By asking that question, you have confirmed it works as intended. Yeah. Perhaps each inquisitor keeps their own horrid little diary. Hmm. Either way, the prologue goes on to ponder if this book is, in actuality, a weapon designed to sabotage faith and duty, which, yes, that makes sense. We have the galaxy-spanning ecclesiarchy on one side, preaching from a holy book written by a very heretical brother, Lorgar. Then, on the other side, you've got a book of very niche fetish pornography, which is being treated by the Inquisition as the most heretical thing known to man. Good thing priorities are in place. We... Did stop preaching from that book, my lord. Have you really? Have you actively really trying to? We are actively really trying stop? to. My one eye may be blind, but the black pit still sits. It's his shadows, beings past our reality, and the book has enlightened me as to their true nature. I have changed my mind. This fetish pornography is definitely worse. Tentacles. No. Did they tell you to burn things? Leon, a rank amongst the Inquisition's dedicated demon hunting division is also mentioned known as Hidden Masters. This is very incongruous, especially given that Jack Draco is a member of the Ordo Malleus, which is as fucking subtle as the namesake implies. And after this, the 
actual prologue begins. A good book starts with one prologue. The adventure of a lifetime starts off with at least three. It finally introduces Jack Draco, who's writing in first person here. He is, and I quote, a secret inquisitor of the Order of Malleus. Not so secret anymore! Secret Inquisitor is practically an oxymoron, Ian Watson. Secret Inquisitor Jack Draco starts hyping up his secret adventure by spoiling the key events in the book. He says he has gone to both the Eye of Terror far in the Galactic North and the Emperor's very throne room in secret. Then he briefly humble brags about having done those things, even while considered an impossibility by the masses. One man could not possibly have gone on such a journey, yet here he is. He goes on to claim Inquisitors are seekers of truth, which is true, except when it's not, which is always. They may seek the truth, but when they found the truth, they tend to cover up the truth with heresy blankets and then pretend like the truth is the not truth. What? Truth. And now, a metaphor for your consideration, by Ian Watson. Possession of a secret is no blessing, no hidden jewel. Rather, it is aching to a poison toad lurking inside a gem-encrusted box. Mm. Oh, bravo! Just good, mm. good, beautiful. Uh, you may expect this sort of analogy to be but a one-off. It is not. Secret Inquisitor Jack Draco then starts telling this story in third person, likely for dramatics. It will become obvious as we continue why that possibly could be. His reasoning is actually as follows. <coughs> Though no demon I, I feel in my bones that it might prove inauspicious to utter my own name over much in my own voice lest I somehow be summoned and bound by hostile human forces. Therefore, I shall become he. I, Jacques Draco, will tell the story of Jacques Draco's experiences to this data cube in the hopes that the Master of the Malleus, or of the Inquisition, may authenticate the truth of what I report and determine to take action. In that event, you, whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever, whenever, may be scanning these words as part of a briefing poised on the brink of a deadly mission. I hail you, fellow Inquisitor, Marine Commander, Hidden Master, Whomever. You see, this is probably one of the worst things you could listen to before undertaking an assignment as he suggests, mostly because the grammar requires you to read it two or three times. Hail, Draco, I am your Emperor. Allow me to reiterate what you have just said. Your reason for writing in third person from here on out is, in fact, not because you wrote the contents of the book in before you wrote this disclaimer. It is instead, because you are avoiding having your newly disgusted comrades run their way into your love quest dungeon, and to bind you down. I completely understand this was the same logic that drove me to not tell my Primarchs about my webway project. I hate everything you just said and I will ignore it. Right, so, I particularly like the implication that he is invoking the true name clause as though he were a demon. Similar to the name he provides as an example, Flyg Zulzale. Where am I? Oh my lord! Fuck off. Shit, a giant skeleton! <laughs> no demons in the throne room, Magnus. No promises are made. <clears throat> so, hey, I am unsure why the secret inquisitor in question, Draco, appears unusually far into the record. Also, his one defining characteristic is to act like a shitty little snake child. Just like a boy. Eat the death porridge, sir. Shut it, snop. Uh, moving on. Draco begins describing his companions, of which there are three. The first is the previously mentioned squat, who goes by the name of Grim. Dumpy Grimbo. The second companion is a navigator named Vitali Google who apparently looks very old, but is only about 30. A bit par for the course there, I suppose. The last one is a Calidus assassin, of all things, who uh, plays the role of Draco's mistress. This is the first of many signs that this book is going to fuckland. 
and never returning. And her name is Melindy. Quite a gaggle of misfits. Yes, I'd imagine from the outset that this looks to be a fun adventure filled with peril and entertainment and clouds. Hold, brother. If we weren't to quip about this book every time we find something objectionable, we will remain in this chamber until next week. The boy will starve. Oh, I know. I can just drink my own blood. No. I would like to add that he is not speaking in hyperbole. I can't determine that we would actually be in here for an entire week. I guess we should just keep it to a minimum then. Yeah, well, that's the end of the 20th and final prologue anyhow, so, uh, yeah, moving on to the first chapter. Inquisitor. Chapter 1. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. The chapter opens up on the planet of Stalinvast, in a hive city known as Vasilariov, amidst a vast and ever-encroaching junglescape. The hive city keeps the jungle from getting any closer to the walls by shooting it with a number of gun turrets. This being a very effective use of time, energy, and resources, rather than using a series of defoliants instead. Perhaps they have more ammo than they do weed killer. Isn't the hive city in question a manufactorum as well? Yes, they also use the jungle as target practice for their weapons testing. It then goes on to describe a group of robotic warriors who are also being constructed and tested. This is strange. All robots in the 42nd millennium are considered archaeotech. It is considered impossible to construct new ones. Unless this world happens to have found an incredibly rare STC and never shared it with the rest of the Imperium. What an absolute fucking shame, if that is the case. Oh, after that comes an absolutely stellar description of the High City's towers, being large coral-like towers with rose-red, scarlet, purple-pink colors. It then goes on to describe a series of suburban structures which are likened to a... fungal dinner plate. Not very appropriate colors for a High City. <laughs> it's all the colors of the warp! Hogwarts truly is a disgusting locale. Uh, there are also space marine vehicles being produced here, as well as space marines going through harrowing jungle exercises. And he then swiftly moves on to describe what appears to be a gene stealer infestation that is rapidly eradicating everything in the hive city. <laughs> that is as rapid a tonal shift as I've then ever heard. there's finally some interactions between the four primary figures that we shall follow for the remainder of the record. Secret Inquisitor Draco has the huts for the Calidus assassin. <laughs> Everyone has the hugs for the Kalidesu assassin. Hmm. Don't really think they become an item, though. I, I think Draco and the girl end up hating each other due to psychic chauvinism. I think you might be skipping ahead somewhat. Draco talks for a bit about the assassin, Melindy, about where she's from, namely, uh, the planet Kalidus. <laughs> I must remind everyone that Calidus is not a fucking planet. Indeed, my lord, it is a temple. Temple. Yes, yes, and how she is dressed in a very thin toga and wearing a pointed eldar like shoes. Clown shoes, no, of course. <laughs> I mean, the party is intentionally disguised as a rogue trader and his entourage, so it makes sense. Clown shoes never make sense in any context, and I will not have you debate this. Anyway... You would be verbally murdered. Anyway, Draco is on the planet to oversee a not-secret Inquisitor, one Hawk Obispal, as well as the quelling of a Gene Stealer uprising. Apparently, nobody bothered to tell him that Gene Stealers are not Koa's demons, as he seems to think they are. In his defense, I am fairly certain that most people were unaware that Gene Stealers were Tyranids, until recently. It's fair, since the Gene Stealers came long before the Tyranids arrived in the galaxy. The Tyranid's morbid answer to a vanguard. Uh, oh boy, here he comes! Boy, close your ears. <laughs> there is then an overly, overly long description of Melindy getting naked, taking polymorph, and coating herself in sin skin from a spray can, and leaping into some ductworks. While this happened, the lads are openly staring at her sapple form as she crams herself into a ventilation shaft. Polyjuice potion is a hell of a drug, kids. The purpose of this action is to continue to oversee the battle between the Planetary Defense Force and the Gene Stealer Incursion. In the scene prior to this, Jock utilizes some sort of, uh, Jokero technology. Fucking techno monkey tech. 
There are these little flying drones that are almost invisible to the naked eye, with which he uses to investigate the battle as it unfolds. As you know, using an undetectable means of subterfuge and investigation is the lesser of the two options, when your other option is to send out a large, pleather-bound woman who has to crawl through ductwork and kill people to remain undetected. But she needs to help kill the aliens, or they'll steal their jeans. Wizards don't wear jeans! Shut up, boy! <sighs> And that covers Chapter 1. Inquisitor, Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, we take a break from the horny escapades of Jack Draco to behold things from Hart Hobby's pulse perspective. It is equally as morbid. I am pretty sure he quotes an ancient bad text by the name of my cap or something. And if any of you out there are familiar, you will know why this sucks and will understand why corporate cleanups of the Inquisition are justified. Yeah, after this, Arbuspal and his troops proceed to cull the gene stealers. This scene continues on for a bit, not going anywhere in particular, until we cut again back to Draco's hotel room. Right. Draco appears to be musing on the warp for some reason. He's also doubting his, um, hardness. Quite literally, he wonders if he's truly hard enough to handle tasks like the one now before him. The way this man doubts his capability to do his job is really telling of the Inquisition's hiring practices. I mean, it would be if he weren't somehow super competent regardless. Then we get a fun description of Grim the Squat's home life and how his strain of humanity lives. This proceeds to be sharply contrasted by the next scene in which Mary Lady transforms into a gene stealer but not via polymorphin, and how she then proceeds through the ductworks to get closer to Obispal's position. And then we shoot back to the hotel again, where Grimm is preparing to head out and assist Mary Lady, who is now a gene stealer, so... After this, there is a bothersome discrepancy regarding the assassin highlighted. She is an initiate, and yet she is actively utilizing advanced jock arrow tech. That is to say, extremely rare and complicated alien technology, just here, in the hands of a self-professed initiate. Father, could it be that she is just that good? Shut your noise, holy you cockatoo. Merlindy finally reaches Obispal and saves him from a gene stealer that was sneaking up behind him. She then deftly climbs back into the dots where she belongs. Meanwhile, though, in another location, the squat known as Grimbo is riding on a power trike! Specifically so that he may rapidly collect Melindy and return to the hotel room! Uh, all the while, Draco looks on using his alien spy technology, and the writer takes no time in admitting that Draco wants to have sexual relations with the Calidus assassin while she is disguised as a gene stealer. Hmm, I wish death for myself. Should we judge him for what he likes? Boy. <laughs> yes. That's what this close to the window, boy, I swear. Finish the chapter, please. No, no, wait, we're finished. That's that's basically chapter two. Inquisitor. Chapter 3 Yes. Uh, Grim continues his trek through the streets and side passages of the Hive City on his power trike and notices several things. Bodies standing upright, killed in these massive street choking crowds of people, all of them bashing into each other trying to evacuate. Watson continues describing scenes like this for at least two pages. I shall not. Good, there is enough grim here for all of us. Uh, he collects Melindy and takes her back to the hotel <laughs> on his power trick. <laughs> In the hotel, everyone ogles her new form for some reason. Dark Draco then proceeds to have an internal monologue on how, how he. Oh, he really wants some of that gene stealer piss! <laughs> that is a statement I will not repeat and already regret having said. No! Move on swiftly. Moving on, there's uh, not much more to this chapter. They. 
talk on how polymorphin works to an extent. They talk about Marilyn D requires a lot of food to transform back due to the calories required to transform in the first place. Draco orders a sumptuous feast for everyone, while Grim appears to be less than enthused. He muses that there are millions dead. And here I am. <laughs> and that although the gene stealers are losing this fight, that fact is but sugar on the porridge of death. This is the best book ever. These assholes then have the gall to point out that I have no way of experiencing pleasure at all. Which, while true, is very rude. Aren't they? Eating fried chicken while talking to each other? Uh, I wish for fried ostrich. My family can barely afford grilled carps cakes. These wizards are truly living a life of unrivaled opulence. Well, unrivaled as compared to an average hiver anyway. The amount of nuts, sickles, and galleons these guys are slinging around is ridiculous. It's like they're eating a succulent leg of bird in front of an, an audience of poppers. Please stop, very hungry. I shall get you a large, non corpse sandwich when we are done, boy. Provided you behave yourself, and cover your ears when appropriate. I recall this being the end of Chapter 3. Yes, you are correct, my lord. Inquisitor, Chapter 4. Ooh, Chapter 4 starts off with Hark Obispal, oh no, being hailed as a hero for quelling the incursion. Annihilating a gene stealer cult is apparently easy enough a feat that it can be done in a... a day or two. And then fanfare! A glorious celebration is held wherein people are dressed up with lizard heads because... I don't know. That's just a Stalin Vos cultural thing, I guess. But in the meantime, Draco broods in his hotel room claiming that the conflict is not yet resolved. His psychic abilities are telling him that there is further amiss with Stalinvas. As any Inquisitor will tell you, there is rarely any reason to assume that an evil is truly vanquished. Obispal therefore strikes one as a proper jackass, concluding his investigation without making sure all is truly well. Father. Lorga. Shut the fuck up, you two gremlins. <laughs> As he sits in his hotel room, Draco proceeds to pull out a leather container made from the flesh of a mutant. Just like my book. Nasty. Then he uh, retrieves from it the Emperor's Tarot. For the uninitiated, the Emperor's Tarot is a deck of psychically attuned crystal wafers that psychers may use in conjunction with the shattered parts of my great psyche to predict future events. It's not exactly accurate all the time, but it gets close, and that is what matters. My other other dad Zinch is a lot better at that. <gasps> we need to stop inviting co asp boys onto this Voxcast. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, he uses the terror to divine some information with regards to his mission and Stalin Vast as a whole, and finds that uh, his prediction is interfered with by a man who looks like a uh, Elder Harlequin. He also divines on one of the cards uh, as an image of Mehalindi, which I assume gives him a raging hard on. Boy, stop quoting him. It is forbidden. Hey, boy, perhaps you should become a custodian. You are still young enough to be torn apart and reconstructed by the alchemists. I will risk a window to have your bulbous frame thrown out of here. Oh. Wait, how are you even holding that shotgun? I will make an attempt to scurry this along. So, after looking at his Manpura cards, Draco then muses on the assassin, which is then immediately interrupted by Melindy herself reappearing, no longer in the ducts where she honestly still belongs. They talk for a short time about the mission at hand, as well as the mysterious Harlequin man. She then talks to him about... Okay, yeah, you take this one. <coughs> An infamous assassin by the name of Mother Gullet who used her polymorphine to swallow a planetary governor's infant son. What bearing this has on the story is beyond me, but it sure is 
interesting. What is she, Babbin? Uh, one moment, boy. She apparently ate the child in order to use it as leverage against the planetary governor who was being unruly. It's obviously written as a lesson to all unruly children out there that if you act the renegade, an assassin will come to your house and devour you. Remember that well, boy. The next time you ask ridiculous questions might be your last. <laughs> Silence. Your continued harassment of the boy will yield you the same fate as that tech priest you are so fond of throwing out the window. Bold of you to assume you could grab a hold of my unctuous form in the first place. Are we done with this chapter yet? Not quite yet? yet, my master. Jock goes on an inner monologue, talking about his time as a young man on a distant planet, his home planet, where he first learned to be an inquisitor in, uh, like, inquisitor kindergarten or something. He professes that he was a child genius, and that he quickly excelled in his studies, and with that information fresh in our brain, that is the end of chapter four. Child genius, yes. Inquisitor, Chapter 5. And Chapter 5. In this chapter, the team departs from the hive city of Vasilariov to another nearby hive city known as Kefalov, where Draco seems to think there is a sizable Koas presence. He detected it after meddling with the Emperor's turret. And, oh boy, while in transit from one hive to the other, Draco monologues internally once more. He's now reminiscing about a close call he had as a youngling being stuck on a black ship bound for Terra. In case you are unaware, listener, the black ships are part of a fleet intended to collect and transport psychers from all across the galaxy, shipping them to Terra. Draco has been picked up by one of these ships and was to be sacrificed to this here skeleton. Only I am allowed to call me that. I'm a rebel, what can I say? It is through this vignette that we learned he was romantically interested in a young psycho girl around his age. Aww. And that by being spared from his fate to be sacrificed, he was unable to be with her. He uses this as a flimsy excuse as to why he sexually repressed this record taking its every chance to talk about every person's desire for the sex! Because Ian Watson is a free spirit not bound by what makes a book good in the conventional sense, only focusing on what he, himself, wants to write about. And isn't there something quite liberating no, in that kind of mindset? No! no. Not when you're recording an Inquisitor's investigation into a potential coerce incursion, <laughs> one of the biggest threats known to man! This is not relevant information! Do not say... Do not listen to him, Ian Watson, or any other would-be scribe out there! Follow your heart, not a formula! You stop! We require no more sewer goblins writing about their arcane sexual afflictions! Yes, we do! I will... Learn to write. What have you done, Magnus? Inquisitor Leech Person will have his day in the sun. Shut up, boy. No one who can read would want to read that, and I can read, and I can tell you that no one would want to read that. So there. Well, this is quickly escalating out of hand, so listen, please. Draco and company arrive in the second hive city and begin to make their way to its underbelly, as that is where the ruinous energies are coming from. While investigating, they come across a number of ruinous tentacles intertwined with the streets of the Underhive. They go ahead and start cutting into them with various weapons. The record utilizes flowery language and purple prose to describe how they go about this, almost to the point that it's completely unnecessary. No, not even to the point. It's completely unnecessary. They are certain that this mass of tentacles is the source of the energy. <laughs> Nevertheless, Draco and the gang now meet with the clown man himself, Sephro Carnelian, for the first time being thoroughly introduced to him as the reason why these psychic tentacles, the origins of the psychic energies, the so-called Hydra, is on the planet. Draco then starts shooting with his plasma gun and makes a fucking awful statement that goes, blessed are the ignorant, Unless they are inquisitors, which, while being a true statement, is just so strangely put when referring to Koas. I believe this is the site of another discrepancy, as my book had no mention of a combat spell being used. If anything, it's likely they moved the tentacles rather than cutting them in my copy. 
that and apparently he and his compatriots use a sort of catalyst to channel their psychic energy. This catalyst being about the size of a twig? Yes, and then the chapter ends with the assassin chasing after the Harlequin man. What a cliffhanger. Why does everyone keep saying that? Ugh, Inquisitor. Chapter 6. Oh, nausea. Maybe this is my next movie. Yeah, okay, this chapter has the assassin going through, uh, a literal assault on the mind of the grisly carnal variety by a clown man with a psychic tentacle spawn. It might sound mildly amusing, but no, it's just in poor taste, so... <coughs> yeah, spot on. Very poignant, poor child. Moving forward... Ian Watson, why do you do this? The chapter then goes on to be even worse by having the assassin say that she wants to perform exemplary suicide for having had her honor besmirched, and then after some frankly weird attempts at consoling her, Draco goes on an internal tangent about how he's lonely and sexually repressed, and that he wants to fulfill his love quest. We in Watson, sewer goblin extraordinaire! Okay, rub the garbage in all you want. But you're forgetting to mention that Draco, Melindy, and Grimm return to the hotel room to find it broken into. Inside, the navigator Vitaly Google lies tied up with a leather bag over his head face. He reveals to the gang that some mysterious assailants had broken into the hotel room, tied up and stolen all of Draco's Joker Tech spy gear, including all of the spy flies. This has given the Harlequin man an upper hand, for he can now see Draco wherever he goes. Ooh. It also apparently needed specifying that Google had shit himself whilst lying tied up in wait for rescue, and that Grimbo the squat released him, cleaned him up, and then gave him a massage. That squat sure is... tender. Alright, that is it. End of chatter. Inquisitor, Chapter 7 Allow me to summarize the small amount of actual progression we had in the last chapters very quickly. The party encountered the Harlequin man, Zephyro Carnelian, who used... ways to get information out of the assassin Melindy. The Harlequin man goes on to explain that the chaotic presence in the Underhive is a warp beast called a Hydra. He then chases off the party and they are forced to seek the planetary governor's astropath. Yes, in chapter 7 we are given... A very descriptive view of the planetary governor's penthouse. The planetary governor is apparently a mutant, which would be a shocking twist if it weren't for the scantily clad girls with eyes twice the size of normal human eyes having the sex with him in the other room as Draco enters. This is the literary equivalent of seasoning a lemon with a lime in an effort to make it more sour. You just can't really get more sour than what you started with. After this, they simply have a talk with the governor, which leads them to gaining access to an astropath. This brings us to Chapter 8. Inquisitor! Chapter 8! So the planetary governor leads Draco and company to a secluded part of his palace where he introduces them to the astropath, one Mama Pajin, who has a large quantity of small free creatures with her. I believe she refers to them as... Well, cats. She seems to identify with cats because they are weird creatures. Draco dismisses the governor and speaks with the astropath. He informs her that they require her psychic abilities to contact the Imperial Ravagers Space Marine chapter in order to perform an exterminatus on the planet. It should be noted that outside of this record, there are no other instances of this chapter being mentioned. Even within our own records of Space Marine chapters, this group is somewhat of a mystery. Probably White Scar successors considering their ravaging name. After the discussion, Draco takes the old woman aboard their ship and begins to depart. On the ship, called the Termentum Malorum, name. there is an interestingly bleak portrayal of you, my most throne bound master, as a mummified corpse standing in 
something akin to a miniature temple dedicated to yourself? In my version, there is a very imposing base relief image of me standing triumphantly over fucking Horus. Not entirely sure if this newer version of the record is trying to suck up to me, but it's nice to not be referred to as a corpse. Draco then, uncharacteristically for an Inquisitor, changes his mind on the Exterminatus. After consulting his remaining drones and learning that the horrid clown cosplayer, Carnelian, has whisked the Hydra away from the Underhive. The evil presence thus removed, the planet is no longer a suitable target for Exterminatus, and the order is cancelled. Somehow. They then enter warp drive and depart for a lead on Carnelian and the Hydra. In transit, the party talks with each other for a while, bantering on squats and their life cycles, and how they can live to be almost a thousand years old, and that the older they become, the stronger they become psychically. Interesting if true. Then, in another extreme tonal whiplash, Mama Pargine reveals to the party that she had sent the Exterminatus Order anyway, because she had suffered unreasonably at the hands of the governor and his family. Ow, my neck! Whoopsie! A planetary genocide level oopsie. Mmm, yep. And to put icing on this mass murder kick, this astropath is initially extremely pleased that she killed an entire plant and all potential robot warrior STCs that might have existed on it. But then Grim, bless him, astutely reminds her that all her cats were down there too. And then she cries a bit. She's not a good pet owner. Uh, I am in agreement, boy. That is no way to treat a wizard's pet. And with that cat clismic event out of the way, we move on to Chapter 9. Inquisitor, Chapter 9. Halfway there. Let's keep a stiff upper lip, my friends. No, this book makes me limp and feeble. Draco's ship has since dropped out of the warp, and arrived at the location they were heading to, a space hulk, or a collection of ruined ship remnants hurled together, floating through the depths of space. Uh, isn't it an awful idea to traverse a space hulk without proper forces? Yes, it is usually the job of Terminators, who have armor necessary for such a dangerous task. The Inquisitor simply intends to enter with some flimsy spacesuits because he is... Bad. No, no, Draco isn't bad, he's good. The best. Whilst approaching the Hulk, they talk amongst themselves about Draco's past inquisitorial work, in which he would slay demons and then have the visages tattooed onto him. Wow! That sounds like an excellent role model for the children, tattooing the likenesses of demons on your body. Boy, do not listen. This is actually a poor example for young minds such as yours. Okay. This Hulk is the supposed location of Draco's lead, and they go through a brief period of preparing to penetrate the Hulk's still active foreskin in order to reach its clogged interior. Keep that two way minimum. The writing is enough, as it is. They make their way inside and are caught in a trap by unseen forces using. Gun robots? Which are referred to as gun servitors in my version. Yes. They fight their way through most of the servitors before being apprehended and overwhelmed. They are then brought into a chamber where a few figures are standing, one of which is the clown freak himself, Sephro Cornelian. In addition to him, there is also Hark Obispal, the allegedly incompetent Inquisitor, and another figure from Draco's past, one Ball Forense. Ball's the leader of these men, who are apparently a secret order of inquisitors unknown to the Inquisition at large, one known as the Ordo Hydra. As this is revealed, the chapter ends. Inquisitor, Chapter 10. Chapter 10 is one of the greatest chapters, at least as far as being descriptive is concerned. It is nice for a change of pace, having a bit of light description instead of an incessant lusting after gene stealer asses. Hear, hear, my master. In any case, the chapter continues where they left off in 9, and the prime members of the Ordo Hydra begin to explain their goal to Draco, who they trust immediately. They tell Draco that their plan is to utilize the Hydra to unite the Imperium, as the Hydra is a powerful psychic being capable of just such a feat. From there, they intend to use the combined might of the newly unified Imperial Psyche to completely obliterate the warp using your mind, Lord, as a beacon. 
an interesting plan. I can only see one minute issue. It's that this small gaggle of Inquisitors with no oversight are intending on unleashing a warp monster onto the Imperium as a whole, including me, to create a human hive mind all linked by and under the thrall of a great material beast. That doesn't really seem like a good idea at all, my lord. Accurate. I'm surprised you think so. Having a human hive mind sounds like one of your greatest wishes. I am complaining about the involvement of a warp monster, not the concept of a hive mind. Ah, so just replace the giant immaterial squid with the big angry warp skeleton full stop and it'll be f I. I know you are dunking on me, but you are right. So after they finish, Carnelian explains that this Hydra's abilities had already been tested on Stalinvast, and thus they had a starting ground from which they could base their plans on. Draco then interjects informing the Harlequin Man of one fatal issue. Stalinvast has been wiped out by the astropath Mama Pergine. This information seems to solve Carnelian for a moment, who seems to undergo a number of emotional flashes while he processes the information. Before he draws a last pistol and blasts Mama Pergine, seemingly in despair that an entire planet was annihilated for no good reason. I am now rooting for these Hydra weirdos. They killed Danny the old woman, who destroyed an entire planet. And, and cats! cats. <laughs> and that was the end of chapter 10. A short one, but reasonably alright. Inquisitor, Chapter 11 Following the execution of the vindictive old lady, Chapter 11 brings in a more relaxed setting. As in, they've moved to a... dining room? On a space hulk? The concept of constructing a dining hall aboard a dilapidated congregation of ship's parts is... weird. Weird is a light way of putting it, my lord. Carnelian briefly explains his reasoning for killing Pergine, and then goes on to extend the invitation to join the Ordo Hydra, so that Draco might assist rather than hinder the Ordo's plans. Again, having more real reason to trust Draco, since he has been functioning as a secret inquisitor, incidentally working against their wishes this whole time. What better way to stop an investigation than to bring the investigator in on the grift? What better way to disband a horrible cult than to have their leaders bring an opponent into said cult as a high-ranking member just because he seems nice? Touché? This trust in Draco is further illustrated by them giving him a small sealed container with uh, a chunk of the Hydra in it. Their intent being that Draco will go out into the Imperium and spread the Hydra. Draco takes this box and leaves with his party in tow for the ship. Aboard the Tormenta Malorum, they begin to wonder what they should do. Grim being of the opinion that they should simply flee to the furthest reaches of the galaxy and hide amongst the uncharted stars. Google shares in this idea. Draco and Merlindy are on the fence, however, and they go to the quarters to think on the matter. Draco seems to be lost in thought when suddenly Merlindy enters his room. Boy, ears. Yes, sir. They talk to each other about their concerns and insecurities. Then uh, they begin to have sex. Whoa, 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 whoa! Ho hold up, that—that's way, way different to what's Draco in my book. Goes on to describe Melinda's various tattoos, having now seen her supple naked form. It, whoa, 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 stop! That, that's 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 Draco wrong. What? Even a tattoo of a spider upon her unshaven groin, in which Draco begins to. What? <laughs> what? It is then just no, described as a hairy Wait. spider tattoo, which lends further credence to Ian Watson being a sex pervert. Evidently, it was so good that Draco is exhausted afterwards. His long-standing love quest comes to an end. They're done now, boy. I could still see the images in my hollow eye. No. Hairy spider tattoo engulfed him. Why does this book curse us so? Their frustrations and insecurities are laid for the moment. The two then decide to not flee, but to take on the Ordo Hydra. They figure that Carnelian specifically had showed the assassin the abilities of the Hydra in such a horrid way, specifically to show them how total a tyranny was being planned by the Ordo Hydra. Carnelian must thus be a double agent out to manipulate Draco and his gang to fight against it. 
Melindy then goes ahead, uses some polymorphine, and consumes a portion of the Hydro they were given so as to gain immunity to it. Then they prepare to depart for the Eye of Terror. This ends Chapter 11. Inquisitor, Chapter 12. Picking from where we left off with Chapter 11, Chapter 12 has us mid-transit to the Eye of Terror. Just as a reminder, do not go to the Eye of Terror. That is a bad idea. They then enter the Eye of Terror in order to find the source of the Hydra so that they might learn of a way to vanquish it. While on the way, they see a large Coetic warship, which, according to the author, uh, looks like a crab. While traveling through the initial layer of the Eye, they settle down and have a nice dinner. That's a weird thing I've noticed. Almost every meal they eat is of the highest quality, and they eat them at the most bizarre times. Like tacos on Tuesday. That, that's pretty much it. Chapter 12 is kind of inconsequential. Inquisitor, Chapter 13. The Tormentum Malorum begins its approach into the Eye of Terror in search for a specific planet. Which planet specifically? Uh, I'm not sure. I may have glazed over that information. Sure it wasn't the planet of sorcerers at the very least. But they are indeed searching for one planet in particular amongst the countless consumed by the eye. In any case, they begin their approach to one of the planets, a dark green sorcerer world, which is For those quick-witted in the audience, this means we are about to descend into the Principality of Gross. And they land in the foothills outside of a city which they have great trouble visualizing due to the intense green fog. I understand the need for urgency, but that really just sounds like an absolutely terrible idea. Let's just land in the fog of war on a planet that has been overtaken by chaotic energies, with no supporting force, no idea what we'll be facing, and only a funny squat to defend ourselves. Tactical genius at its finest. There could be trolls in those foothills, or weird bald men drinking unicorns. <laughs> As they land, they take some time to muzzle their void suits somewhat to make them blend in with the local populace, as well as have Mehalindia shapeshift into a gene stealer. An act which pleases Jacques to no end. Uh. Anyway, they depart closer to the city so that they might find some answers as to what the Hydra could be. While traveling, they cross paths with another group, but these beings are cursed with the taint of Koas, as Ian describes gleefully. Boy. Yes. Oh boy, I am now going to read this entire segment where the record proceeds to explain how these horrid creatures look for no reason. Here we go. <clears throat> A bull of a man, clad in plate mail, led a dozen capering monstrosities out from behind a stalagmite-like tower of rock. Formidable horns curled from the sides of the leader's head, jutting forward streaked with dried gore. His armor was wrought in the contours of bones. Metallic bones were bent into hoops around his thighs. Bones melded to bones made runic designs. Leering alien skulls capped his knees. Giant toe and finger bones encased his boots and gauntlets. An obscene codpiece of artificial bone bulged, encrusted with bloodstones suggestive of altars. He also wore a fine satin cape that cut a dash in the breeze, and a golden necklace with an erotic amulet. To Jock's senses, the bull man radiated an eerie, brutal sensuality. His gear seemed to say that even bones could copulate, that even metal could debauch itself, though not in any soft style. Behind the leader trotted an upright tortoise of a man whose squamous head poked out of a barrel-like shell spangled with iridescent stars and crescents as if he was a walking galaxy or a mad magician. Silk ribbons fluttered like streams of burning gas. Did he ever crawl out of his shell onto some couch at night, tender-bodied, squashy, all of his pleasure nerves exposed to the ministrations of some large wet tongue? 
Another warrior wore a brass waistcoat and leggings glued with some gold braid as if furry caterpillars crawled upon his armor. In place of his left arm, he sported a sheaf of tentacles. On his head, an exuberantly ringleted periwig. Yet another, who was visibly hermaphroditic in plas crystal armor, thrust forth a great lobster claw studded with medallions. One thin, tall, small breasted figure, braced with a clanking baroque exoskeleton, bore the head of a fly, upon which perched a cocked plumed hat. A brass-bound ovipositor jutted from her loins. Her neighbor was a striding, slavering, two-legged goat in rut with a starched, organdy ruff fanning around his neck, lace ruffled at his elbows, and a velvet cloak. Only one massive man appeared to be true human. He wore a nightmare parody of noble space marine armor, engraved with a hundred demon faces, though disdaining a helmet. Great flangled pipes soared sidelong from behind his head as if copying the bald man's horns in reverse. That head was of statuesque marble nobility, the hair bleached white and permed into waves. At the tip of his aquiline nose, he wore an emerald ring that suggested jock a drip of mucus. One cheek was tattooed with sword and sheath poised like lingam and yoni. Alongside this traitor moraine, there danced a mutant woman who was at once beautiful and hideous. Her body, clad in a chain-mailed leotard trimmed with rosettes and puffs of gauze, was blanched and petite, her hair blonde and bultuous. Yet her jade-green eyes were swollen ovals, set to skew in an otherwise sensual face. Her feet were ostrich claws, ornamented with topaz rings. Her hands were chitinous, painted pincers, a razor-edged tail lashed behind her plump buttocks. How like a demonette of Korath she seemed. Google groaned at the sight of her and took an involuntary step forward. Grim gritted his teeth and... Yeah, that's it! I... I do not need to read anymore, you get it! Hey ha, got him. When I said gross you were probably thinking Nurgle. Nope, it was Slanesh the whole time. Absolutely disgusting! It comes as no surprise that we get a painfully accurate depiction of the blight of Koas upon the human form. Do you know, in addition to all the boobular nipple rings, exactly why we got this drawn out explanation in the first place when all of these creatures are dismissed as irrelevant barely a chapter after the fact is a question everyone already knows the answer to in an to. effort to obfuscate his true purpose on the planet jock banters with the coas towns force about things for a while and taking no time to explain to them that he is having sexual relations with Mehalindi, who I, uh, my, my, might I add, is still disguised as a genius Oh, oh wait, you have forgotten the best part about her transformation! Oh. Did you not wish to talk about the fuck pouch that she grew to simulate a vaginal opening as a part of her disguise to these filthy coass folk? Maybe this is my next movie. A normal wrote this. And yet I find myself ostracized for wanting to call them. The servants of he who shall not be named are wily and disgusting. Truly Ian Watson understands the subject matter better than we could ever hope to. I don't ever want to understand cause. On that boy, we agree. I mean, shut it! Suffice to say, the Koaz warriors are only slightly duped by Draco's ploy, and combat ensues. Lovingly rendered combat, I might add, to be entirely fair. It is not bad. At least he goes to as much detail in describing their wretched bodies being torn asunder as he does in describing the wretched bodies in the first place. Yes. After dispatching the band of Koas people, they move closer towards the city on the horizon, when they hear a very 
distant noise, which is explained further in the next chapter. Inquisitor, Chapter 14. Alright, so we begin Chapter 14 as Draco and his cohorts enter a city. Horned, phallic towers, wrinkled, ribbed, blistered with window pustules, cancerous breast domes swelled, fondled by scaly finger buttresses, tongue bridges linked these buildings, sliding back and forth, scrotum pods swayed, orifice entries pulsed open and shut. Some buildings were in congress with each other, headless, limbless torsos laying side by side, joined abominably, an architectonic orgy. Ian Watson must be a master at writing one-handed at this point. I will give him that. Uh, this is, of course, one of the other great wizarding schools. I couldn't tell you which, but all you need to know is that Hogwarts is sanctioned, <laughs> and this is not. Hogwarts a bust, I guess. <laughs> bust indeed. See, man. Draco and friends can hear a noise coming from the city. The noise, as it is now described, seems to be emanating from a large, vile figure upon a palanquine being pulled by chaos monstrosities. Ah, that must be Hagar the Horrible, the bear man who tore Uncle Vernon's head from his body. Around said figure is an entourage of warriors clad in traitor's armor. They are briefly described before- Bool! <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bool. The obese woman upon the palanquin is a noble lady of sorts that is shouting for her concert. Bool! Yeah, shouting for him, Bool. He was uh, the bull of a man described earlier. The one with the bones, the bulging bones. As she screams, her voice is so cacophonous that it rings across the boob hills and is audible from impossible distances. Jock and the party proceed to set up an ambush to eliminate her protectors. Then they do that, with relative ease I might add. Something that really shouldn't be doable on a coas planet with naught but bolt guns and a psychic weapon. They're just that good! All the adepts of Slanesh are just that bad. Very bad. Her escorts thus disposed of, Jack begins to torture the fiend for information as to what the Hydra is and whether gene stealers are involved. He gets a bit of information from the thing before she is eliminated from a long distance by none other than Zephro Carnelian, who appears to have sniped and killed this monstrosity with only a last pistol. This statement is bothersome. A LAS pistol does not have a significant enough charge to be fired at long range and be expected to instantly kill a malformed Chaos Worshipper. Uh, actually, I didn't pause that my first time through. Yeah, uh, what? Do not dwell on this. There are far worse things in this record to be dwelling upon. He's just that good! Haven't you realized this? Right. Of course. That ends Chapter 14. Inquisitor. Chapter 15. We're almost done with this, I'm glad to say. I need to take an aspirin. About 50, to be precise. Yes, yeah, same, actually. My head is ringing fiercely. And that's a vicious feat, considering my mm, superhuman physique. Oh, you all shall drink from the manclesical fountain of aspirin after this is finished, but there is not much left to this toe. Carnelian has finally confronted Draco and his party, and he chastises him for betraying the Ordo Hydra. It is as though the people within this book forget the limitations and abilities of various beings, ideas, and concepts seemingly at will, almost as if they are only paid any attention when they serve the narrative. But my man, Emperor, this is an account of someone's adventures, not a work of fiction. Oh, right. Well, forget what I said. Jacques Draco is just a massive weirdo. Yes. Yes, he is, my master. Carnelian then orders his two compatriots who appear to be armed with uh, heavy bolters to begin to take down Draco and his team. Uh, naturally, Draco and company escaped pretty much unharmed. 
They then depart on the Tormentum Malorum, seemingly with no plans, and no idea how to tackle their newfound problem. You'd think that a good place to start would be to get past the giant dog that they encountered earlier. It's obviously hiding something crucial to the story. Sir, I think you may be reading a different story. Shut it, boy. You have no regard for foreshadowing, and obviously have been slacking off in reading our Hold book. Hold book upside down, sir. I, I, I knew that. There's a picture in here that's upside down, and I wanted a better that's look. That's not the book we were reading. Huh. It isn't. Shield Captain, what is that book you are reading? I have seen this book before. This is a fictional account of a wizard from ancient Terran times. This book was intended for small children during this time, and yet he thought it was an account of a rogue inquisitor seeking to undo an Imperium-wide conspiracy group. That is extremely funny. W w what do you mean? Everything I read was a lie? Well, yes. It's a fictional story meant to entertain babies. Clearly, it did its job. I... 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 I, I hate you! This is all wrong! This is a lie. Truth is a lie. As... Jack Drago would put it. You don't understand! I love these people! I, I... I... I loved Ronaldo. He was a lovable goof who was never afraid to speak his mind. And, and now he doesn't exist! Oh no, it's happening again. It's okay, sir. He still exists in your brain. <laughs> it's not the same! <laughs> Wow, he took that hard. <sighs> it's just like the time when we were reading him The Giving Tree. I, I think he's taking it a bit harder because he's the one reading it this time. But hey fucking nerd, keep going. We need to finish this up with or without him. Right you are, my master. So, we left off on... Oh, that's it. Uh, Alright, so uh, chapter 16 is here. Inquisitor. Chapter 16. Right, thank you. Uh, this chapter seems to meander quite a bit. Uh, it starts off with the crew aboard the Tormentum Malorum lamenting their current position in the state of affairs in the Imperium. Jock is concerned that his crew doesn't trust in his ability to lead them. Grim is despondent and seems to want to drink excessively. Merlindy shows absolutely almost no emotion. And Google continues on to contribute a bare minimum to justify his existence in life. He's a navigator. What were you expecting out of the little pervert? I don't know. I just find this existence redundant. Jock could have spent this entire time having not even mentioned his name, and I think we would have had about the same idea as to what is going on. Complain about redundancies later. Read now. <laughs> of course. They spend the chapter visiting the resupply depot and the star system of Bandicoot. Bandicoot. It says it says Bandicoot. I'm sure of it. Whoa. You are in need of prescription spectacles, sir. The star system is called Bandicoot. It's practically the same. Anyway, during this time, Google seemed to dwell on the repulsive fiends from the Coas planet and how he felt aroused by her presence. Meanwhile, Jock muses on his attraction to Melindy in her gene stealer form because, of, of course, he does! At least he acknowledges it. Unfortunately. While all this is happening, your boy Grimbo slips from their attention and goes on a drinking binge aboard the station, staying for way too long and almost getting left behind as the Tormentor Malorum was preparing to depart without him. To think, we almost lost the only redeemable person in this record due to impatience. As they leave the station, they resolve to find a way to alert the Emperor himself on Holy Terra about the plot. This irrational bag of bones must know of the tentacle monster. If it were up to me, and I had the ability to take in visitors, who are screened to the point where we can see the DNA of their very pubes, I would... Granted, if I were to know what Jack had been up to prior to this point, I probably would just throw him out the window. While I wouldn't begrudge you that, my lord, I would prefer to be the one to throw him out. I would too, honestly. As would I. If I were strong enough, I would destroy him. Do not worry, boy. 
Someday in the future you may grow strong enough to defenstrate foul, depraved, secret inquisitors. Oh, that is likely the first and only time I shall be warned by boys' childlike wonder. Oh, well, while well, finally en route to Terra, Mehlindi reveals to Jock a horrifying truth. And for once, it isn't anything utterly depraved. When she was a young trainee for the Calidus Temple, she was given some sort of special... Uh, thing? Again, not depraved, but it's not very well elaborated on. Regardless, said thing stops her from transforming into anything other than a gene stealer with her polymorphin, and that she is more or less consigned to this singular and specific talent. That's doesn't sound like a very good thing, to be honest. Nope, but this does end chapter 16. <laughs> Two more to go! Inquisitor, chapter 17. We smash cut to Jacques inside of a crate on board a transport ship bound for terror. That's a bit of a jump there. Why, yes, yeah, straight into the action. You see, Jacques and company have managed to board a black ship now and stuff their bodies into boxes in order to be transported to Terra without worry. Jacques explains to his readers that he has convinced the not-secret inquisitors aboard the black ship that there is some sort of kidnapping ring that has been stealing the young, psychically imbued children who are to be sacrificed to the Emperor as slaves for... various uses. He appears to imply something very foul here, though... Sincerely, I hope it is simply me reading too much into this. The not-secret Inquisitor aboard the black ship that is transporting the boxes is described as having alien fetus earrings. I just wanted to mention that. Move on. I am sorry, Master, but I must point out how completely asinine it is that this secret Inquisitor is attempting to secret himself onto Terra by lying to the supposedly highest security captains of a black ship and hiding in a box. He is sneaking onto Terra by hiding in a box. He is attempting to sneak into one of the most heavily defended locations in the entire Imperium by hiding inside of a box. That would be funny, were it not so personally insulting. Stop dwelling on it and move on, damn it. Uh... We time skip again to Jacques and his party disembarking from their crates, which appear to be bound for the kitchens in the lower sections of the palace itself. After they sneak out of the kitchen, there is a bizarrely detailed description of a custodies killing a rat. Oh shit, I think that might have been the shield captain. After this, they disguise themselves as agents of the Administratum using some grey robes. They are let through into a secure area simply by having these robes on. In this portion of the workings beneath the palace, there are signs of heavy machinery being used to power the throne, and there are... Alright, are you with me on this one? Three, two, one! Sodium vapor flambeau behind high false clear story windows of stained glass painted patches of amber ichor, sap, and hemoglobin across the tessellated floor. For those of you who survived this barrage, this large, needlessly descriptive sentence is being used to describe a window, the lamp behind the window, and the color of the floor. Stylistic writing! This goes beyond stylistic. This is not just flowery writing. This sentence is a whining hedge maze of inanity that is indicative of everything ridiculous about Ian Watson's writing style. It took the more illiterate of us five whole fuck mothering minutes to look up the definitions for each of these words in various dictionaries we had on hand. Please, if any of you are thinking of becoming scribes, do not stop and force your readers to drop your book and pick up a dictionary every other chapter just because you need to assert your talent for finding obscure words. And to any intellectual types out there beginning to write an email to us about how it is the sign of a learned man who includes such advanced words and phrases in a text medium, this record is shallow and only artificially deep. It is depraved, uncanny, and most damning of all, boring. This is not a text that is even remotely entertaining or informative due to the way that it is written, the way its story and personages are handled, and even its breakneck pacing. 
What little entertainment we have derived from this text is obtained purely through the sheer hilarity that comes with something so irrational attempting to be presented as a serious story. This book is practical. Maybe this is my next move. You, you, uh, you good, my master? I find my reality growing ever more frustrating, and sometimes I need to have this established by physical means. Right, so that's your little rant over, Father. I do not entirely agree with your assessment. I think that while his stylistic writing can go quite far in places, there are some chapters in which it fits to illustrate how truly gruesome and depraved the Imperium can be. It's like he's painting a detailed, intricate picture with nothing but his words. I agree with this comparison and only that reading this is like watching paint dry. <sighs> Look, we, we all have our problems with this account. From its sheer unbelievability to how this Watson man portrays everything with this bizarre sexual tinge. Why if it isn't the bacon calling the salmon oily? It's adorable when I do it. What I think he's getting at is that we've all got problems with this thing. Whether or not Jack Draco indeed managed to infiltrate the Imperial Palace and came in here and spoke with you Lord. A fact I refute vehemently. The way this book is written makes it very hard to get invested in his travels, as it is quite clear he was, indeed, trying to get us invested. If you feel the need to enhance a tale about a rogue secret inquisitor seeking to save the very Imperium of Man from total destruction at the hands of a sinister cult, then you have not told the story properly. Rogue was correct. The story stood every chance of enrapturing U.S. with its contents. And yet here we sit, repulsed. It's rather sad when you think about it. Kind of, yeah. Should we continue on and prepare to end this book? Sure. Whatever. This has gotten quite sad, and I would prefer to feel angry at the contents of this book. Right away, my master. We left off at the overly descriptive lamp window and floor, right? Good. Uh, further described in the room which Draco and company find themselves are the pumps and machines that fill the throne with life. The life in this situation seems to be a number of fluids containing Sino's corpses and drugs, of all things. These pumps are manned by awful, lumpy children who look as though they have tuberculosis. Again, thank you for that, Mr. Watson. This raises the question. Child, were you ever in the Underpalace? No, my lord. My friend Sunsi was for a while. I haven't seen her in a long time, though. I think she has the job of boot, 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 gre greasing the gears and blood bumps. Oh my. Moving on, I say that a lot this cast. Uh, there is an admittedly humorous depiction of petitioners trying to enter into the High Lord's hearing chamber. It is humorous, as there are numerous merchants selling things to people on the line, from rocks, dogs, to all kinds of greasy finger foods, and even portable latrines. Ha! <laughs> Normal. Before I was a box surf, my overseer wanted me to sell snacks to people on the line. I'm glad I got this job instead. I get to be with the Holy Emperor instead of getting stomped flat by folks in line like many of my siblings. What? And that concludes Chapter 17. One more to go, folks. Inquisitor, Chapter 18. The dawn of the final chapter. Now, in the most baffling of scenarios, Draco and his party leave the palace and depart for the slums of the city surrounding the palace. What? What is the name of that city again? Uh... I... Uh... I don't know, actually. I really am a privileged bastard, aren't I? Huh. What? Well, they go to that city and apparently spend months moving back towards the palace. They do this because they think they are being followed by potential assailants. While roving through the city, they kill 
numerous people and murder more than a few families in order to assume their lifestyle and hide from these unseen assailants. Mm. Bunch of fucking murder hobos. They're not very good people. They eventually wind up at the Eternity Gate, disguised as somewhat high-ranking officials. I find it incongruous that they murder a sister of battle, a tech priest, a small child, and similar just so they can steal their identities and sneak into the palace. As if making their party look even more suspect would somehow help them break through our security protocols. Maybe it was Taco Day? A uh, good point. Whatever the reason, they get pretty damn far into the literal Imperial Palace. I am ashamed! I wouldn't be surprised. People seem to waltz into here all the damn time. Before they are made to be made by the guards, time stops. Father, apparently you stopped time so you could talk with him. You then conveyed his incorporeal form into this very throne room and spoke with him about already knowing all about the Hydra and that he would be your agent against evil. I can say, without a shadow of a doubt, that this man has never in his life ever set foot in this throne room, corporeally or incorporeally. You sincerely cannot remember if you had ever spoken to him, Lord? Sincerely. Neither this man nor his ramblings strikes even the smallest of bells within my memory. This unfortunately means that our entire story was all for naught. I hope. <laughs> as a custodian guard, this is quite gratifying, but as a reader of this book, it is thoroughly unsatisfying. And that is also the end of our book. Inquisitor! Epilogue. <laughs> I'm feeling the burn from reading this now. I am not reading any more of it. If you people desperately want to know how it all ends, the book ends with an old man shitting himself to death. Is anyone surprised? No. Ah, so it does, ending with a truly potent allegory to the human condition. Inquisitor. Over. I suppose. Uh, well, and truly. Alright. So, since this took a year to get through and my entire body has been lit on fire, by Ian Watson, I wish to stop here for now. There will be no questions this time around because I know the vicious blob beasts listening to this will only make it worse. Thank you for this mercy, my lord. Thank you. And for inviting me on to this Voxcast, I would also like to say... What did I do to deserve this? Is this my way of repenting for my previous wrongdoings? Please, I beg of you, do not exact this intense a punishment on me again, for I fear my old body will not be able to take it. I must go now, and drink from the fountain of aspirin, and sleep, long and deep. I wish you all good recovery. You're all a bunch of whiners. Magnus. Do you consume the taco on the Friday, or the Tuesday? Taco Tuesday is on Friday. Fucking time to pass off right now. That was a co-ass <laughs>